ladies and gentlemen, we'll come to order now. If you're still finding your seat, go ahead. Uh, our ushers can help you find a place where you can sit. And if you're still in need of a handout, go ahead and raise your hand so that we can have our ushers bring you a handout. We want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to follow along with the texts. This is really amazing that we would have uh, such a full house. I'm absolutely thrilled that you're here. And it's perfect timing for that because this is the first of the Athanasius lectures that we've had over the last two years that actually has something to do with Athanasius. So you're, if you're here for the first time, you've made it to the right lecture for the first time. Um, we have the privilege tonight of welcoming Kevin Illage. Kevin Illage is... I second that. Ke Kevin Illage is a BA student in uh, Biblical Studies, Interplit... Why do I always... I'm getting nervous from the laugh. I didn't use the word bachelor this time, so what's wrong? He's <laughs> a BA student in Biblical Studies with an interdisciplinary focus. So what's so funny about that? <laughs> He's also a uh, junior in the Ancient Christian Studies Honors Program. We're thrilled to be able to hear from him tonight. May I say a quick word of prayer, and then we want to give as much time as we can to his actual lecture. But please join me for a word in prayer. Our gracious God, we're so grateful, so grateful for the life that you give us, uh, that you continue to so generously and richly supply us. And Lord, we are deeply humbled and grateful that you would allow an event like this to come together where we can enthusiastically welcome one of our own. We can listen to his insights, learn from the dialogue, learn from his reading. We just rejoice, God, that you've so blessed our community with this experience. Lord, tonight's lecture is about the incarnation, as I'm sure you know. But as we reflect then on what it means to that you did incarnate yourself, that you allowed yourself to become enfleshed, that you dwelt among us, that you became one of us, that you sweated sweat like we do, that you laughed laughs like we do, that you cried tears like we do. We rejoice. We pray that you'd help us to understand yourself and our relationship with you deeper tonight. Bless Kevin as he speaks to us. Uh, give him peace and joy, we pray in your name. Amen. Please welcome Kevin. Can you guys hear me? Awesome. Thank you, Sveti, for giving me this picture of Athanasius and writing, Athanasius is watching you. That was very... Um, I want to thank Dr. Armstrong um, for the opportunity to be here and share one of my favorite projects. Thank you for critiquing, encouraging, and helping me to think critically about Athanasius, my hero. I also wanted to thank um, Professor Malone for his help, as well as Dr. Vreeland for being here and hopefully not be too harsh on me. I want to thank the audience, some of you my friends, for being here, and my family Skyping back home. I'm all the way from back home. Um, it means a lot to this island boy that you guys are all here. Um, just a second. Okay. In a thousand years, I could not have hoped for a better Friday to give this lecture. Just last week, the Christian world at large stood still as we remembered the death of Christ and his resurrection. But did you have the right understanding this past weekend? Hence, my title, Athanasius on the Incarnation, Are Contemporary Christians Orthodox? About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? One cannot read this passage and not cringe at the idea of Jesus feeling forsaken. What does it mean that God forsook Jesus? 
Was the Trinity really broken at this particular time? Moreover, what do we do with a passage like Philippians 2, where it is stated that Christ made himself nothing? Did he truly lose his attributes? How could he still remain God? These are all important theological discussions that I believe Athanasius, the 4th century father, can help us understand and have an orthodox response to. I believe that Protestants have such a wealth of information that we must look to earlier Christian tradition for help in overcoming modern problems. In this specific case, I believe we can go back to the church fathers to see how they have thought about Christology instead of trying to reinvent the wheel. Church history is full of passionate thinkers who have thought deeply about the orthodox truths that we hold today. And it would be beneficial for us if we decided to glean from them. J. Todd Billings states something similar when he asserts that new possibilities are opened up by this method of retrieval. He states, quote, It is a possibility of seeing scripture, theology, and the world itself with new eyes. Passages of scripture that we have read many times before can be seen with new insight, new possibilities. This involves simultaneously critiquing our ordinary ways of seeing things and gaining new ways to understand scripture and theology. End quote. This then leads me to my thesis. Tonight, I want to assert that we have moved away from the foundational truth of Christianity. That is, a correct understanding of the Trinity because of a faulty understanding in our doctrine of Christology. In an effort to make Christianity easier to understand, we have watered down the full truth. And I believe that Athanasius, known as the father of orthodoxy, is the man to bring us back to a full and better understanding of God the Son and subsequently the Trinity. What books and chronology am I going to use? Lots of books. <laughs> a work worth mentioning in detail is RPC Hansen's The Search for the Christian Doctrine of God. This is the latest and, in my opinion, best chronology of Athanasius. For this lecture, I am going to base my timeline on his. The problem with Athanasius is that we don't have a critical and extensive account of his works and life. But I believe Hansen more than delivers in this book. So, who was this good-looking man named Athanasius? I first heard of Athanasius in the fall of 2010. I still remember being fascinated with the young bishop and how he defended the faith in light of persecution and trials at a time where heresy was about to end the day. These circumstances pushed him to be known as Athanasius contra mundum, Athanasius against the world. I always wanted to make a stand like this for the Lord, and I'm hoping someday to stand tall in the face of heresy and not flinch. Athanasius lived from 296 to 373 AD and penned several works. His most famous not being anything theological, but a biographical book titled On the Life of Antony. I suggest you read it. It still lies on my shelf as one of the most influential books I have ever read. Athanasius was not a theologian or systematician. The young man was a pastor thrust onto the spotlight when he was just in his late 20s. This is very evident once you read his On the Incarnation. Philip Schaff points out the same thing in his introduction of the theology of Athanasius. He seems to have a very pastoral care for the people. What is very interesting, as Hansen notes, is that Athanasius was often wholly astray on the details of the Bible, but he has a remarkably firm grip. Indeed, in view of his career, one might say the grip of a bulldog on its main message. In the short biography penned by F.A. Forbes, she includes the story of the moment when the bishop, Alexander of Alexandria, while waiting on prelates to come to his house, saw him, Athanasius, when he was younger, performing a baptism with his friends. He, Athanasius, assigned himself as bishop, and he baptized two of his friends, following all the intricate details of the baptismal ritual. So much so that Alexander stated that the baptism was a true one. 
Can you imagine this? A young boy, no ordination, performing baptisms. God certainly had an awesome path ahead for him. However, I am well aware of scholars who have deemed Athanasius as a power-hungry man, who uses bishopric and popularity in a political way to gain power and standing among his people. I will not give much credence to those theories because they just fall flat on account of others who have defended and said the complete opposite about Athanasius in his own time. For instance, he was deemed by Gregory of Nazianzus as, quote, the true pillar of the church, and that his, Athanasius' life and conduct were the rule of bishops, and his doctrine the rule of the Orthodox faith, end quote. So what can we make of his theology? Throughout his own works, I think, we can have somewhat of a blueprint of how Athanasius tackles the identity of God the Son. He does so in the following manner. Divine nature, or Jesus' role in creating. The divine dilemma, or the reason for the incarnation. The incarnation proper, or the act of putting on humanity. And lastly, the repercussions of the incarnation or what happens in and after the incarnational act of dying and resurrecting of Christ. This is the type of outline I want to follow tonight as I attempt to crack the door open to Athanasius' thought. But first, let's take a look at Arianism. It would benefit us to know what it is, because it helps to paint a picture of how an orthodox understanding of the Trinity and God the Son came about. Arianism believes that there had to be a mediating person between created beings and God because created beings cannot bear the unmediated weight of God. This is where Jesus comes in. He is thought of as the Superman, the one who mediates, but is not fully God. They, the Arians, then are left with one God who is ingenerate and one who has a beginning. The reason why Jesus is not fully God does not lie just in this mediating principle, but rather the fact that God is impassable. Arius and his adherents had a difficult time trying to reconcile the two. But hopefully after this lecture, you, the audience, will leave with a better understanding to how to still hold firmly to the doctrine of impassibility while understanding that Jesus is God by delving into the two passages I introduced in my lecture tonight. Sadly, the points mentioned before, that of thinking of Christ as some sort of Superman, but not fully God, leads to either polytheism for the Arian or another completely wrong view of who Christ is. As the audience will see, Athanasius' staunch opposition and defense of the deity of Christ is nothing short of brilliant. I believe that Athanasius gives us a good starting point in how we think about Christ. To get a solid understanding of who Christ is, I assert, we have to start in his pre-temporal state. Athanasius had a good grasp of this, as even his first work, Contra Gentes, Against the Gentiles, was devoted much to the deity of Christ. As the audience will see, the majority, if not all, of his writings have a strong emphasis on the divinity of Christ due to the controversy surrounding his own time. Athanasius' language concerning the Son changed over the course of time. In his first work, Contra Gentes, we see that he uses different terms to what we later come to know as essence or substance, the Greek word usias. He uses the term image, a con. Lewis Ayers asserts that one could clearly see the influence of the late Alexander of um, Alexandria on Athanasius. When Athanasius writes about the image, he states that the son, quote, is the unchanging image of his own father. For men, composed of parts and made out of nothing, have their discourse composite and divisible. But God possesses through existence and is not composite. Wherefore, his word also has through existence and is not composite, but is, the only, but is the one and only begotten God, 
who proceeds in his goodness from the Father as from a good fountain. End quote. This language is seen again in his against the nations. As Athanasius states that he, Jesus, is the supremely perf perfect issue of the Father and is also alone Son, the express image of the Father. Athanasius' response to Arius' adherence in his four orations against the Arians is one of Athanasius' longest works, and where his views concerning the nature of the Son are most clearly seen. Here is where the term essence or substance makes more appearances. He states that the Son is, quote, very Son of the Father, natural and genuine, proper to his essence, wisdom only begotten, and very and only word of God is he. Not a creature or work, but an offspring proper to the Father's essence. Wherefore, he is very God, existing one in essence with the very Father. While other beings to whom he says, I said you are gods, had this grace from the Father, only by participation of the word through the Spirit. For he, Jesus, is the expression of the Father's person, and light from light, and power, and very image of the Father's essence. To Athanasius then, the Son is unoriginated. The Son always was, and there was not a time when he was not. He argues that phrases like, once was not, or before it came to be, and when and the like, belong to things originate and creatures, which come out of nothing, but are alien to the word. The second person of the Holy Trinity shares exactly the same nature as the Father and the Holy Spirit. And this means that the Son, just like the Father, is simple in nature, not consisting of parts. He also argues that the Son is unchangeable and unalterable, something that, as we will see, is very important to how we deal with some troubling passages in Scripture. So, a Christology from above or below. What is the alternative to what Athanasius is saying? Starting from the ground up, so to speak. It then leaves us starting with what kind of man Jesus was and then working up to his divinity. This is a very common starting point today, as many who argue for the historical figure of Jesus work through his ministry, move up to his death and resurrection, and ultimately his divinity, as is laid out in the works of Gerald Collins and Wolfhard Pannenberg. However, I assert tonight that this leaves us with a somewhat adoptionistic view of the Son, which I want to caution against. Jesus' human life doesn't even start without the miraculous working of the Holy Spirit. The quest for the historical Jesus, while a noble endeavor, leaves his prehistoric state as the last topic discussed. And this is a huge mistake. He is deity and then became man, and not the other way around. Having a proper view of the Trinity at intra is the most important and first thing we have to discuss while doing theology. Your view of sin, grace, salvation, the church, and any other doctrine in between will always follow your doctrine of God. Let me explain. You can correct areas where a false notion of God is posited if you start from above rather than from below. In the same way I argued for a Christology from above earlier. In my review of Todd Billings' work, Unity with Christ, I argued for this exact notion when I posited that unity with the Godhead cannot be pente pentheistic because our orthodox understanding of God is the fact that he is wholly other and he is not dependent upon the creation for his existence. His relationship with said creation is his free choice. On the one hand, condescending to us so we can approach him, this notion also called the eminence of God. On the other hand, he is transcendent. That is, in his nature, God is sovereign or otherwise stated in control over all that has existence or will come into existence. In this way, starting with the doctrine of God proves to be the best method in delineating 
an orthodox understanding of several other doctrines, like anthropology, soteriology, uh, doctrine of salvation, ecclesiology, <laughs> and others. Struggle bus. Okay. <laughs> Athanasius then, I argue, uses this Christology from above. However, contrary to what Alistair E. McGrath asserts in his Christian theology, I believe that Athanasius uses this ontological argument rather than a soteriological argument to dismiss Arianism. While McGrath's formula does work and is seen in Athanasius' works, I assert that the predominant one in his earlier works lies in the fact that Jesus is deity and creator. So McGrath will have this syllogism up. He states that God saves people, Jesus saves people, Jesus therefore is God. Athanasius predominantly, especially in his earlier works, and even in his four orations, would have a different one. Stated that God created everything, Jesus is before all things, thus Jesus is God. Contrary to what the Arians posited, Athanasius believed that the Word is the one in whom all things exist because of his closeness to the Father. Quote, being present with him as his wisdom and his word. Looking at the Father, he fashioned the universe and organized it and gave it order. End quote. Kellet Anatolius appears to hold this view as well from his introduction on the theology of Athanasius in his work titled Athanasius. He actually suggests that the soteriological principle works within the broader scope of creator and creature. In his later works, Athanasius seems to move from this cosmological viewpoint to a more soteriological viewpoint, an idea that R.P.C. Hansen puts forward in his work. German theologian Adolf von Harnack agrees with this assertion when he states in his History of Dogma that the Logos Son is a redemptive, not a cosmic principle. My assertion that it is more of a cosmological principle, however, does gain some traction when one considers Jurgen Moltmann's words. I believe he is onto something when he states that, quote, any functional and merely soteriological Christology is manifestly on the wrong track, simply because it abolishes itself in this way, end quote. Moltmann seems to assert that the Incarnation was necessary, regardless of our sinning. He has two very compelling reasons for why he believes this, stating that if Christ came only to be a mediator, Christ's role would be superfluous once we were reconciled to God. He also asserts that having a mere soteriological view falls short of the purpose of the Incarnation. Because it is the perfected self-communication of God to the world, it has to be more than a saving work that will end once everyone is saved. It has to be something that lasts for eternity. Jesus is a necessary being and not contingent upon the act of salvation. Now, this sounds like a pretty solid argument, and I agree in part with what he has to say. An ontological argument, like I posited before, would work better as you don't have to deal with the problem of Christ's function as mediator or savior ceasing once we are glorified. Thus, Moltmann's objection there is truly a good one. For a mediator is not needed anymore when two parties are reconciled. However, I believe that Moltmann completely missed the fact that Christ's mediatorship does not end in our salvation and glorification but is forever. A notion that Calvin pans in his institutes and that later Baving would assert as well. Having a soteriological principle seems to work if we define Christ's saving work as something that does not end once we are glorified, but is the bridging gap between us and the Creator for eternity. This debate makes us immediately consider the Incarnation and how it came about. The Divine Dilemma. 
Athanasius states that it was, quote, impossible that God should leave men to be carried off by corruption because it would be unfitting and unworthy of himself, end quote. Athanasius masterfully gives his reader the dilemma that God would have on his hands and solves it over two chapters in his early work titled On the Incarnation. The conclusion, as was quoted before, would lie in the fact that God, in his goodness, chooses to redeem mankind. This is where having a proper understanding of Christ's nature is essential. Athanasius asserts in the second chapter of On the Incarnation that repentance alone could not possibly reverse the fall and how it would take someone immortal to reverse a death that is eternal. After delineating what Christ's death accomplished, Athanasius highlights the purpose of the Son's death on the cross, saying that, quote, this, undoubtedly referring to his atoning death, is the first cause of the Son becoming men. End quote. And that the only way that men might come to know Him once more was by the coming of the very image Himself. The dual nature of Christ and the subsequent debate surrounding it is dealt with in Athanasius' works, but not at length. This debate is thoroughly dealt with, with uh, later with the Cappadocian Fathers. However, he does build a foundation for later thought when he speaks on the dual nature of Christ. In the first of his four orations, he states that the term became nothing is in reference to the manhood of Christ. In regards to Jesus' incarnate body, Athanasius seems to draw a sharp distinction between the two natures and posits that Jesus, with deity, took a body that was enslaved to sin. Athanasius does not shy away from the questions that might arise from this statement, but keeps a consistent contrast between the divinity of Christ and the humanity of Christ. God the Son is on the one hand unalterable and not subject to sin. On the other hand, in reference to his human form, Christ was alterable. Athanasius suggests that, quote, the Lord, who is ever in nature unalterable, loving righteousness and hating iniquity should be anointed and himself sent that he being and remain the same by taking this alterable flesh and quote what is interesting is that the bishop never explicitly puts the divine over the human nature but argues that the human nature was sanctified by the work of the holy spirit in jesus's life this in an attempt to refute the idea that Jesus was sinful. This would prove to be important later when Athanasius gives the result of what he believes the second person of the Trinity accomplishes through his incarnation. As he states that only the divine can impart divinity. A notion I will expand on briefly when I talk about sanctification. It is important to understand as well that we are not dealing with a Jesus that suffered from schizophrenia, but that Athanasius, by having this distinction between the two natures, is laying the foundation for what we would later call the four fences of Chalcedon. Two natures without confusion, two natures without changing one into the other, two natures without division leading to two separate entities, and two natures without separation depending on area or function, area of function, sorry. So, how do we deal with the kenosis theory? Having this understanding of the incarnation is very helpful in how we deal with the kenosis theory and the debates surrounding the theory, which I believe is not an orthodox reading of scripture. The kenosis theory is one that is still commonly heard on the streets of modern evangelicalism. Quoting Philippians 2, it states that Jesus gave up some of his attributes while he was here on earth. These attributes were omniscience, omnipresence, and omnipotence. The major proponent of this view was Gottfried Thomasius. He writes, The incarnation involves the deliberate setting aside of all divine attributes, so that in the state of humiliation, Christ has voluntarily abandoned 
all privileges of divinity. Stephen T. Davis, another proponent, appears to make a distinction between the incarnation and the kenosis, referring to the kenosis as that which only happened at the cross, and points to several theologians after Gottfried Thomasius who held the kenosis theory view. Jürgen Moldmann, the German Lutheran theologian aforementioned, stated in the same vein that the self-humiliation of God is fulfilled in the incarnation of the Son. Moldman, furthermore, makes another move and states that the kenosis is realized on the cross. Athanasius seems to assert that the self-emptying was more of a putting on of humanity than it was a putting off of divinity. I believe that this is a much better and a more faithful reading of scriptures that speak to the act of the Son becoming nothing or becoming poor. I believe Pope Pius XII, though not an authority for evangelicals, had a very good point when he stated that the kenosis theory reduces the mystery of the incarnation and redemption. Listen to his powerful words. Quote, there is another enemy of the faith of Chalcedon, widely diffused outside the fold of the Catholic religion. This is an opinion for which a rashly and falsely understood sentence of St. Paul's epistle to the Philippians, chapter 2, verse 7, supplies a basis and a shape. This is called the kenosis doctrine, and according to it, they imagine that the divinity was taken away from the Word in Christ. It is a wicked invention equally to be condemned with the docetism opposed to it. It reduces the whole mystery of the incarnation and redemption to empty the bloodless imaginations. With the entire and perfect nature of men, thus grandly St. Leo the Great, he who was true God was born complete in his own nature, complete in ours. End quote. Um, all right. How do we deal with the forsaken cry? The powerful distinction between divine and human that Athanasius introduces in his works serves as a terrific way to answer the forsaken cry recorded in Matthew, but also his human activities. In his fourth discourse against the Arians, Athanasius makes a point to help his readers understand that, quote, when the word and son hungered and wept and was wearied, he acted as our mediator, taking on him what was ours, that he might impart to us what was his. End quote. Thomas McCall, in his magnificent piece titled Forsaken God, will use this exact reasoning of Athanasius and underscore the point that on the cross, the son was not abandoned in the sense of losing contact with the father, but rather was identifying with us. This is not negating the abandonment cry. Rather, it is putting the proper sense in which Jesus felt abandoned. I agree that this is a far more superior reading than to read that the Father turned His face away from the Son, breaking the relationship as if the two were pitted against one another. You cannot in any way be an orthodox believer and believe in a broken trinity. Because of Athanasius' strict emphasis on the deity of the Son, a notion I asserted we must start with, we have to conclude that this is a better reading and something we ought to take hold of. Incarnation, the cross, and salvation continued. <laughs> now that we have set the table and analyzed what Athanasius' Christology looks like, we can delve into what the relationship between the incarnation and salvation is. In regards to salvation, I assert that Athanasius has somewhat of a proto-penal substitution point of view of the cross and salvation. What I mean by this is just a penal substitution theory before the term was coined. At face value, however, Athanasius seems to hold a recapitulation theory of atonement. He indeed posits, in reference to Jesus, that his part it was, and his alone, both to bring again the corruptible to incorruption. 
His emphasis on ending the corruption is similar to Barclay's synthesis of the recapitulation theory. Barclay gives us this definition. Through man's disobedience, the process of the evolution of the human race went wrong, and the course of its wrongness could neither be halted nor reversed by any human means. But in Jesus Christ, the whole course of human evolution was perfectly carried out and realized in obedience to the purpose of God. It would be disingenuous for me not to put up moments like these where he has a distinct recapitulation theory, and this would not be far-fetched. He is an Eastern Orthodox father, a term I'm using just for clarification purposes, following a list of notable figures who also held to this view. However, notable theologians such as Grotius, Bruce Demarest, and Michael Vlock all consider Athanasius to have a penal substitution theory because of instances where he writes statesman, statements like, quote, he surrendered his body to death instead of all, or he assumed a body capable of death in order that through belonging to the word who is above all might become in dying a sophistic efficient exchange for all and lastly that he may become righteousness for us all these seem to indicate that his view is some sort of proto-penal substitution view however I do think that Athanasius like other church fathers understood that there was more accomplished on the cross and through the resurrection than just Christ dying in our place as a substitutionary sacrifice. The Bible talks about a ransom being paid in Mark 10, 45, Christ being victorious in 1 John 3, 8, Christ being our example, 1 Peter 2, 21, or 1 John 3, 16, and Christ bringing us back to the state prior to the fall. Interesting note that in Ephesians 1, 10, to bring under unity or sum up was rendered literally recapitulate in Latin. Evangelicals would do well to hold all of these together rather than picking just one and championing it as the way. How does Athanasius' theology inform our salvation in the area of sanctification? To Athanasius, the believer's life is not enslaved to sin anymore and is deified in the eyes of the Almighty. He makes this explicit when he states that, quote, We human beings, however, were set free from the passions which belong to us and were filled with the righteousness of the Logos. End quote. While this does sound like contemporary theology, Athanasius does not seem to have the sanctification process worked out in his theology but closes the gap between conversion and glorification and infuses the believer with righteousness at the moment of conversion. He states this explicitly in his opus on the Holy Spirit when he refers to the seal, that is, the Holy Spirit, as being that which Christ anoints on the believer. This may sound like our Reformed tradition, but he continues and states that, quote, being thus sealed, we are duly made, end quote, and uses this as grounds on which believers share in the divine nature immediately after conversion. I believe there are three reasons for why Athanasius has this view on sanctification, or rather, does not have a sanctification process worked out. First one, Athanasius simply did not devote much time on the Christian life. He was more interested in the central theological debate that surrounded the Incarnation and how the triune God communicates and lives at Entra. This is the reason, I believe, behind the bishop's collapse of the gap between conversion and glorification or experiential sanctification in modern theology. Second, it might just be the cultural historical context which he was in where a strict emphasis on living righteously needed to be placed on converts. This same thing can be seen in the Apostolic Fathers and earlier church documents. They were fighting against Gnostics and other sects that did not care for living righteously. Righteousness up till then has been something that is actual and not merely positional. 
This idea can be seen, for instance, in early works like the Letters to the Corinthians by St. Clement, Shepherd of Hermas, and also implied in the letter of Polycarp to the Philippians, and lastly, the epistle to Diognetus. The third reason flows from this second principle. It could be possible and very much probable that Athanasius championed this idea of an actual righteousness and not just positional righteousness because he believed in an idea that is called theosis. The idea that human beings can have union, a real union, with God to such a degree that we become partakers in the divine nature. This is all based on 2 Peter 1.4, which states, Through these, He has given us His very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Before we label Athanasius as a heretic, from a Reformed perspective, however, it would behoove us to dialogue with this view of sanctification. Athanasius and our champion church father, Augustine, both seem to hold to justification by just their mere faith. This does not mean that one is saved by works, but it rightly recognizes that works is very much in relationship with salvation. Theosis, then, does not mean that we become gods, but, ra but rather rightly recognizes that our ultimate destiny is to become the image of the triune God. As I state this, I want us to remember what Athanasius was so good at. That is, his creator-creature distinction. We would never become a capital letter I image, but we will be a creaturely reflection of the Most High. This is very important as you read very different senses in which writers in the patristic era have used this term. In any case, points two and three ought to act as a wake-up call for us to view our salvation, in particular righteousness, as something that is mysterious, serious, and not merely a legal term. We not only have letters from Paul, but we also have a letter from James. This heavy grace notion is rampant in Western thought. But I will posit that this concept of righteousness being something that is actual is something that could serve as a tremendous nudge for us. In conclusion then, I want to point back to three main points for the audience to ponder tonight. First one, we, we have to start with the Christology and doctrine of God from above recognizing that God truly is wholly other. Second, let this way of doing theology speak to other doctrines, like salvation, anthropology, church, etc. And third, study Athanasius, or any church father for that matter. Evangelical, evangelicals or evangelicalism is in dire need of students who are willing to stand firm and teach in an orthodox manner Theology that takes what the church has taught through the ages into account. Before I end, I wanted to read the Nicene Creed. Not the revised one of 381 AD, but the one that Athanasius was a part of in drafting. This creed marked the moment where orthodoxy won the day. And it's very special to my heart. And I hope that someday it will be for you as well. The Nicene Creed reads, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, the only begotten, that is, of the essence of the Father, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, both in heaven and on earth, who for us men and for our salvation came down and was incarnate and was made man. He suffered, and the third day he rose again, ascended into heaven. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead, and in the Holy Ghost. But those who say, there was a time when he was not, and he was not before he was made, and he was made out of nothing, or 
He is of another substance or essence or the Son of God is created or changeable or alterable. They are condemned by the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's that time in the evening where we want you to get your best questions on. Go ahead and find your seats again, and we'll begin our panel discussion. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm thrilled you're having such a good time, but let's go ahead and get this panel discussion underway. So please go ahead and take your seats. It is my pleasure to open our second half of the evening with some brief comments and a question. And so, first of all, Kevin, I'd like to say thank you so much for a very gracious presentation. The subtitle of your lecture, Our Contemporary Christians Orthodox, made me sweat just a little bit. <laughs> I thought this might be a critical presentation, and I was uh, uh, fastening my safety belt to be told that I was a heretic. <laughs> but I really appreciate the grace that you, you wove into this whole lecture. Even from the beginning, Protestantism has a wealth of theological riches, riches and therefore uh, it's not that these, this uh, theology of the Church Fathers somehow undoes a Protestant heritage, but actually bolsters it and increases our ability to embrace that. So and that and on a number of other points, I appreciated the grace with which you handled this topic. In order to give everybody a fair shot at you, though, I'm going to make my only question... <laughs> My only question, very brief, and that is this. Kevin, you come to this campus with an, un with an extraordinary viewpoint. You uh, were raised and had some of your early theological formulation, formation thousands of miles away from our particular context. And what I noticed that was remarkable is that you had a clear passion for these ancient standards of orthodoxy. Do you think that these fourth century ancient standards of orthodoxy can still serve as the guiding principles of orthodoxy today as large parts of the global church try to figure out again what orthodoxy is and that'll be my question thank you yes <laughs> um, yeah there's so much we can glean from not only fourth century um, church fathers but just by looking back at how the church thought about things in those early stages. 
Um, yes, we strive for unity and we strive for those things nowadays. But when you look back at how the church, church thought about things, they were more concerned with theology rather than unity. And that's what united them. So in an effort to like um, bring those people, um, the, the global theology class or, or whatever, um, which, shameless plug, you guys should take it, um, I think our effort would be better used if we strive towards an orthodox understanding of theology. And that's the biggest like thing we can glean from those early church fathers. Oh, dear God. <laughs> oh, brother. Uh, apologies to the audience. I serve the slot of the weak sister. This is not my division, but I'm going to give it a shot anyway. My brothers up here had me programmed to read a whole bunch of stuff on Athanasius <laughs> and his um, teachings and so forth, so I'm going to pull a rabbit out of the hat maybe. This is from Anatolius, uh, Recovering Nicaea, and I think it probably has the full scope um, of what it was you presented today, so indulge me a little bit. Building on the foundation of the common scriptural ground shared with, with his opponents, um, which designates the preexistence of Christ as creator, Athanasius advances with syllogistic force to his conclusion if the Word is the Creator and the Word is extrinsic to the divine essence, then the creative agency of God is extrinsic to the divine essence of God, cannot claim the title of Creator as properly his own. To the exact extent that the creative Son is external to the divine essence, to that extent does God procure the title Creator from outside the proper being. The point is decisive in the framework of the debate between Trinitarian conceptions of unity of being versus those of unity of will. In this debate, common ground was delineated by the affirmation on both sides that the creation was to be referred to uh, divine willing. Athanasius insists that if the Son is the agent of divine willing of creation, he must be integral to divine being in order for this willing to be properly owned by the divine being. In this way, he is striving to surpass the competing emphasis on the sovereignty of the divine will by insisting that such sovereignty is ultimately only affirmed by recognizing the Son's sharing in divine being. Now that passage brings together um, three sets of binary oppositions. A distinction that you made clearly, the creator versus the creation. Uh, one that is in there in a couple of paragraphs separated the ingenerate nature of God the Father versus the unoriginated nature of God the Son, and then finally ontology versus volition. And so I ask this question, of these three binary options, which do you see is the most important in your theology from above? Nice. <laughs> um. I think Athanasius uses the creator-creature distinction to make a case um, ontologically um, for Jesus being divine. Um, obviously, you have um, originistic thoughts um, walking um, in what Athanasius was doing during that time, um, which left the people thinking about the Trinity at Intra about um, the Son being dependent upon the Father. Um, I feel like Athanasius was refining that and making an argument that no, we cannot have a um, volitional, like God willing um, the Son, but um, tapping into that eternal generation of the Son. Okay, now in an effort to do theological whiplash, I'm going to go from um, that to applied esoterics. How does then theology from above affect these four things? Reading the Bible, preaching, evangelism, and apologetics with the cults. Wow. Um, that's a very practical question. And <clears throat> I think, let's start with reading the Bible. Um, understanding that um, Jesus is deity, um, that he is divine, 
in my opinion, when you read that, when you read that um, Jesus died on the cross, um, in my own life, when we watch, for instance, the Passion of the Christ, um, I understand then that, well, he was men, but he chose to be on that cross. So my reading of the Bible, uh, uh, thinking about um, biblical motives, um, completely drastically changed because I understand now that Christ was not merely men, but he was divine. And I think in my personal opinion, um, that that changes the way you look at the Bible. Um, and that then um, speaks into how you live your life. Um, for instance, John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. Um, the ones that the Father gave me are not going to be lost. That's powerful to understand that Jesus was man, but goodness gracious, he's God. He, he holds me in his hand, and that's powerful. Yeah, I don't know if I answered the question. But. Evangelism and apologetics. Well, I think apologetics, um, I, I, uh, the view from above actually have got, has gotten lots of pushback because um, people like Carl Barth, if I'm not mistaken, would say that it presupposes um, Christ's divinity, and that's a mistake. Um, but again, I will posit that we have to start theology with how the Trinity communicates and lives at Entra. So... Yeah, it will, I don't know, all that to say, I don't know really how to, how would that inform the way you do apologetics? I know that it starts with the presupposition then, then Jesus is God and working from that. All right, thanks, Kevin. Appreciate the wonderful lecture. It was really interesting and had a lot packed into it. So I'll just try to bite off a little chunk and ask a question or so. Um, so one of the major points that I think we all heard you making was the distinction between from above and from below mm -hmm. um, in terms of movement toward Christological conclusions. Um, and then you mapped that on doctrinally to the notion of cosmology and soteriology, um, which, which is fairly common. You see that sort of thing in, in the literature a lot. Um, let me read another little, just very, very short um, line from Khalid Anatolis's um, The Coherence of Athanasius' Thought. This guy's like a major Athanasius scholar. That's why he's getting quoted twice. This guy is too, but Khalid Anatolius. <laughs> we'll quote him for a second. Um, Anatolius says that the center of Athanasius theology lies um, in the distinction and simultaneous relationship between God and the world, um, which is a sort of um, complicated way, perhaps, to make the point. And he actually argues that uh, Irenaeus are in the Irenaean tradition. This is where and uh, this is where Athanasius is moving out of um, for this sort of theme. So it's the distinction and the simultaneous relation between God and the world, he says. And that, that seems to me basically right, um, but maybe a little different, perhaps, than what you're positing. Um, and let me try to name the difference, and you just tell me out of that what you might think about that difference. So it seems like... Uh, it's not necessarily cosmology that is a, a sort of ontological order of everything um, God and in the world um, against soteriology, perhaps, that, that need to be played together as two themes in Athanasius's work. Um, and the oft quoted maybe even line of Athanasius starts with cosmology in his early writing, and it's like you pick this up a bit, and then moves to soteriolo soteriological arguments in his later writing. Um, maybe doesn't actually have to be understood as sort of two different themes mm -hmm. to play against each other. And here's maybe another way just to toss, and you're from above, from below language, might get at it to think about it. What if um, when, you're, when you're saying from above, um, and I think you're mapping cosmology on that, you're actually just talking about the order of being, um, what theologians have talked about, the fact that there is God, and then there's all that's not God. There's the world mm -hmm. that comes from God. Um, and what, what if when you're actually saying soteriology, you're actually, in from below, you actually really are meaning the order of knowing, how we actually come to know what there is. And if Athanasius actually is doing something like there's this distinction between God and the world, and there's actually a relation between God and the world, he's actually saying both of those things at the same time, and actually wanting to hold those two together, and actually simultaneously say something about um, what we know down here in the economy, and mm -hmm. the God who actually reveals that, or who is and creates all things. Um, and that there are, those actually are tied together a little more closely in his thought, and that's why you actually see both of them. Um, and 
And then if I could take that one step further, maybe the mistakes that you're worried about are actually when people try to do just from below, um, order of knowing, well, here's, here's what we can see around us, um, therefore, this must be what, what is without actually having revelation come together in the order of knowing. I mean, that seems to me maybe to be your nervousness, yeah. and maybe Athanasius has a little more complicated account of that. What, what do you think of that? Uh, that's kind of a long um, ramble. You hit on what RPC Hansen would do in his, um, I believe, in this uh, search for the doctrine of God, where he believes that it works within um, the cosmological principle rather than two separate things. But in my attempt to make it simpler for the audience to understand, I guess I separate the two too much. Yeah, yeah. well, let me have a follow-up on that maybe. So one, one of your worries, practically speaking, like for people doing mm -hmm. studies and stuff in this is, look, if we do this from below sort of approach, um, and interesting, the figures you mentioned, Collins and uh, Pondenberg, um, have actually had huge apologetic interests, definitely Pondenberg, but Collins has too in some, in some ways. Uh, you've got to sort of do this from below, to maybe Jerry's question, because that actually has an apologetic edge to mm -hmm. it. So right, you sort of show, here's how Jesus actually can be proved to be God on sort of earthly terms um, and demonstrate it to be such, and therefore you can actually use that as an apologetic proof for the gospel. Um, now, you were worried about that theologically. Mm -hmm. your, your language was that's adoptionistic because you sort of have Jesus as a man and he turns into God um, on that approach, um, which again, I think is a valid uh, concern. Does that mean we can't use this apologetically to come maybe back on what you and Jerry was saying? Um, no, I, I'm, if that came across, I apologize. Obviously, um, I'm not positing that it's a wrong approach, right. but I would rather, because I'm cautious in how people perceive Christ, and like leaving his divinity out or um, not emphasizing his divinity, um, that's what I want to caution against. Um, because yet, like you said, it, it has an edge in apologetics because how am I gonna um, you know, talk about Jesus if the person doesn't believe that Jesus is divine? It poses a problem for me because I presuppose Christ's divinity. I won't belabor that, but it is a kind of very live issue in, um, in New Testament studies, the Christian origins folks, Bauckham and, and Hurtado, want to strongly push a Christology from below and say it's actually, how did the church start worshiping Jesus, and then how did we actually come to see him as God? And they're quite conservative in this, um, but they've been critiqued actually on the same lines you're critiquing for being adoptionistic in what they're doing, um, which is kind of interesting. It, even last, was it last week or so, that Bart Ehrman came out with how Jesus became God? Um, mm -hmm. Which is actually absolutely a Christology from below, kind of, again, from not a conservative side. Same set of questions, same set of methods, actually, that he and Hurtado are using, coming to radically different conclusions. And then there's a response book, actually, that came out immediately at the same time, how God became Jesus. I mean, it, it completely <laughs> reasserting the terms the yeah. other way around. Um, so, I mean, so it's a live issue, actually, apologetically in biblical studies, too. Um, and the line you're taking, um, which actually I just want to know what you think about it. I, I think there's something to it theologically is what most say that is actually a confessional issue and you actually do think first about God. Yeah. Theologians tend to say that at least. And these other things are actually are, are then in the order of knowing, oh, we're coming to apprehend the reality that actually is. And they tend to think of it in those terms. So no, that's a good question. Um, it also does again challenge us to think, what can I do with that apologetically? Maybe not what some have said or maybe so. Mm -hmm. We have to wrestle with that. Let me ask one other question um, and that will be my last and we'll turn it back to the audience then. So you made a Protestant point in this, um, a couple of Protestant points, but one that kind of struck us on the atonement um, that was interesting. And uh, maybe there's two pieces to it. I could just ask briefly about both of them. Um, the first piece, maybe, I'll ask what you said last. You suggested we could actually think about the atonement in multiple ways, or should mm -hmm. think about the atonement in multiple ways, not just one. Um, and this would actually be more faithful, um, I guess as I heard the claim, to what was going on with Athanasius and the Patristic Fathers yep. and to scripture, presumably, as mm -hmm. well. Um, what does that look like? Practically, what does it look like to use multiple models of the atonement? Megan, maybe run through some of Jerry's questions in terms of reading the Bible and, and preaching. How does that practically look? I, I guess my, uh, my, admonish, my admonishment was more so than... Um, when you're preaching not to only preach um, Christ died um, for you in your place that is very true but that's not 
the entirety of what Christ did. You're only focusing on one aspect of all that the Bible speaks to about the atonement. What are some of those alls, just to help us? Like Christ being victorious, being the devil, beating death, um, Christ uh, being our ransom, for instance, um, and Christ bringing everything back to the state prior to the fall. Right, right. So, mm -hmm. I mean, if I, if I could try to package what you're saying, if I understand right, you're saying actually the, the whole life of Christ, his life, from incarnation to um, perfect living to death, to suffering, to um, raising from the dead, all of these moments are actually part of what we preach yeah. when we preach atonement. Yeah, and th that certainly is, again, quite a, quite a common push today that people are saying, think more holistically rather than just at the moment of yeah. the passion, um, think across who Jesus is, what he's done. Um, Calvin, quite early on, so the whole course of his obedience, you know, these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure, good. Um, let me then ask one other slightly more difficult maybe question, and we'll stop on that. Um, you mentioned that Athanasius does a proto-penal substitutionary approach. Um, yeah, I just coined that term. Yeah. <laughs> and um, mentioned the recapitulation stuff, he'll, he'll say, mm -hmm. um, but then also mentioned he uses some interesting language. He surrendered his body to death instead of us. He assumed a body capable of death in order that through it um, that all of us might uh, be and live um, in his dying sufficient exchange uh, for all, and then at the end that he came righteousness for us all. Um, it strikes me perhaps like maybe you'd get a pushback from patristic folks on this, and they'd say all of that language is substitutionary, like he's picking up the who pairs and antis mm -hmm. from the New Testament. None of it is actually penal. Um, he's not actually talking about a sacrificial payment. Um, taken instead of another's payment, he's just saying uh, in place of. Mm -hmm. He's not getting to that penal, sacrificial kind of moment. Um, I wonder if you might speak to that. Is that there? It doesn't seem to be there in those statements. Yeah, that, that was just my coinage of the term, but I was hoping to get to that. That he has a, a, a view that somewhat is like what we call the penal substitution theory, but he hasn't doesn't have it all worked out like we have penal substitution theory worked out today. Yeah, but so there are hints of that absolutely. in his works. No, I, I hear you that there's piece, pieces, but I think the pushback is you're going to hear that there isn't actually a picture of him suffering wrath um, for one instead of them suffering wrath. Mm -hmm. This sort of sub, uh, penal act, aspect maybe isn't as clearly there, even if there's a substitutionary one on behalf of the other. But so some will be really uncomfortable with that move and feel like that's not there actually in Athanasius. I would agree. And I would pose uh, rather that, um, well, lots of patristic scholars would say that um, the early church fathers rather had a Christus victor. So going off of that, yes, I can see how Christ didn't suffer wrath, and especially in Athanasius who wants to, um, you know, bring out the idea that they are not pitted against one another. So he tries to stay away from wrathful language. So, yeah. Thank you. We want to open it up to the floor now. If you have questions, and go ahead and put those hands up quickly, because uh, as we've learned from experience, um, things get snapped up quickly. Hello. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin, again. It was fabulous. Um, I just had one question from um, listening to your lecture, and I've been a believer since I was five, so it's been like 19 years, and I've never in my entire life heard that God didn't turn from Jesus on the cross. Um, so that was very enlightening and very different, and it was kind of confusing that I've never heard that before. Um, but I guess my question to you would be, um, what, if anything, would drastically change either doctrinally or in our Christian lives if we properly understood that, that, you know, 
God and Jesus could not possibly separate and that he did not turn away from him because I'd never heard that before. So d does that make sense? Yeah, kind of. Can you rephrase your question? Okay. Um, growing up in the Christian church, I was mm -hmm. always taught that God turned away from Jesus yeah. when he had our sin on him. Um, so in your lecture, I understood that you said that did not happen. Mm -hmm. um, so what, if anything, would change like in our doctrinal approach or just in our Christian lives if we had a proper understanding of that? Like, what would be the difference? Um, I think more than anything, understanding that a triune God um, does not um, work within a subordination um, type of system. Um, they are not pitted against one another, but um, they're willing, their um, action externally and internally is one. And um, having an idea that, um, well, on the cross, um, Jesus and the Father um, were not happy with each other, um, that poses a big problem because then you have a broken trinity. You have Jesus then as a God, lower G, and God the Father being angry at Jesus because of, oh no, he's sin now. And you know what I'm saying? That, does that answer your question? What did I not answer? Because I've never heard anything like mm -hmm. that, it's just going to take like personal processing and everything. But um, I'll think about that and I'll get back to you. Okay. <laughs> Kevin, thank you, um, sir. And I uh, wanted to start off saying I think I have your next topic, if you ever have another Athanasius lecture. You noted that righteousness is not just a legal term. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, a, that's a pretty big statement. So um, that's not my question, though. My question is with kenosis, mm -hmm. um, kind of a more of a practical, you know, question having to do with kenosis because you were very adamant against it, you know, quoted Pope Leo, whatever, the 7th, or I think 12th. 12th. Um, and you know, called it her well, he at least called it heresy. I don't mm -hmm. know how much you were advocating his view on it. But, um, yeah, so what do we do with a passage, you know, like Mark uh, 13, where Jesus says he doesn't know when, um, you know, the end is, is going to happen, neither the son nor the, the angels. Like, just from practically, you know, from, uh, from our point of view, when we're reading the Bible and we come across a verse like this, um, what do we do with, like, the kenosis theory? How do, how do we... How do we answer just a simple question mm -hmm. like that? Um, well, I'm going to preface it by saying that Christ is, Christ's dual nature is mysterious. Um, that being said, at the same time, when you read scripture, you will see Christ saying, um, well, I lay my, my body down and I raise it up. Um, and like statements that speak to his omniscience, to his omnip uh, omnipotence, um, and like even on the presence in places where he just randomly disappears People were trying to get him and he randomly disappears. So having that understanding that yes, he is fully man and there are instances where I Don't know maybe he chose not to know um, I Think that would be a better reading um, and Identifying with us like Athanasius said when Christ wept when he was hungry when he was wearied when he was anxious and stuff like that He was identifying with us because he took on full human nature I could say something else from the tradition really quickly if you want to on that line. I mean that's a great question um, There's at least two ways probably people have answered that from the tradition one would be to say that um, the son, being the perfect son, is saying it's not my prerogative to know that. Um, and actually you can do it from Trinitarianism um, and answer it in that way. The other way is probably from Two Natures Christology um, that I think Kevin's alluding to, that the answer has probably come forth as well in a couple different ways. Um, people have really wrestled with um, how you think about how, the, how the, being fully God and fully man um, work together in one person um, from Chalcedon. And the tradition has uh, settled on understanding that actually the will um, actually resides in the nature, um, 
typically is how this is said. So therefore, he actually has a human will and a divine will that actually work in concord, such that he could have actually said simultaneously, I both don't know and I do know, which is a sort of strange paradoxical thing to say. Uh, but Chalcedon actually sort of forces you to say something like that. So that's the uh, slightly more complicated Christological answer. Um, we usually take a much flatter reading of scripture and say, it says he doesn't know, he just doesn't know. He must have lost something. Um, and the line at least Kevin's taking, which is pretty robust in the tradition, is there's actually got to be theologically more going on than that. Those are two ways people have thought about that question. Thanks, Kevin. That was awesome. Thank you. Um, this is my question. It's kind of towards the end of your lecture, like kind of a more application. Mm -hmm. But um, so toward the end of your lecture, you said that Athanasius did not focus on the Christian life because he dealt more with the theological debates about the nature of God. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the relation between these two, um, nature of God, like thinking on it and then also acting it out? Uh, and do you think that Athanasius believed that meditating on the nature of God is necessary for the true Christian life? Can you truly have a Christian life without a correct view of Christ's nature? Um, and then off that, if this is true, does this mean American churches are not functioning correctly? And can we imitate Athanasius, or does our lack of unity make this impossible? Wow. Okay. <laughs> well, American churches. I'm not going to delve into that one. Um, just kidding. Um, okay, lots of questions. Um, well, practically, I think um, my, my mind immediately when you asked that question went to like um, Thomas Akempis, for instance, where he um, like meditated on the nature of God and that um, spoke into how he lived his life. Um, the fact that God is holy speaks to your life now as a redeemed believer um, because you're going to pursue that, knowing that God is omniscient that's going to speak to your life as well because, well, God knows everything. The fact that he's sovereign, you're going to live a life that understand, uh, understanding that, well, no matter what comes my way, God is above it all and he is in control. So I think there's very, um, very much to glean from just meditating on the nature of God. And that's one question that you asked that I don't remember the other ones. Yeah. Wow, um, that's a good question. Let me get back to you on that one. Yeah. Kevin, going back to uh, the cross, uh, I'm just curious how you would read uh, one passage uh, going back three topics ago to um, how the father didn't actually for I won't use a biblical terminology um, that the father didn't actually turn his back on Christ um, how would you read a text when Jesus cries out saying my God my God why have you forsaken me um, the approach that Tenacious uses just for a shorter answer because there are a lot of people saying that he was trying to quote a psalm from you know, Psalm 22 is that yeah um, that he didn't finish it or um, other people will say, like Athanasius, um, that he was identifying with us in our humanity. That is not to say, though, that he did not feel abandoned. And I think Thomas McCall, if you grab that book, it's awesome. Um, he would underscore that and say that, yes, Jesus felt abandoned. That is very, very true. Because, and he uses Athanasius by saying that he was fully human. He was identifying with us. Can I phone a friend again one more time? Yes. Okay. I mean, so again, the line you're taking is 
very classic in theology, this, this sort of argumentation. Not common in evangelicalism. That, that's why we say we haven't quite heard that. In fact, we sing songs that say the opposite sometimes. Yep. Um, but, um, but you're quite right to say that there is some more nuance maybe to the language mm -hmm. and the tradition there. Um, it is directly tied for sure that that passage, as I think you said, to the condition of embodiment. Like when the Son of God is embodied in the incarnation, the Son of God can actually feel abandoned. Um, but outside the condition of embodiment, this is sort of inappropriate language. Um, it's tied to a much bigger set of questions in the tradition, too, um, which ended up pejoratively getting called the extra Calvinisticum as a fancy term. But it, it turns out it's in the patristic literature mm -hmm. all over the place where they said, you know, even when Jesus became incarnate, the second person of the Trinity didn't actually stop becoming the second person mm -hmm. of the Trinity and leave the right hand of God. And they start um, from scripture itself thinking that actually it's asserting but it's not as though he sort of stopped and temporally was somehow limited, even yeah. in the incarnation, that he actually was still God fully and not even limited in that sense. Um, and very, very different than the sort of canonic readings mm -hmm. um, that we give today. But uh, the tradition has, has asserted this in some pretty strong ways from some interesting exegetical places. So just a little more of an answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a game that I can play too, Brett. Um, remember the ambiguity in the text. You know, Jesus says, Lama Savakthani, which is not what the psalm says. The psalm says, Lama Azavthani, which is a completely different word. Um, uh, uh, Savakthani is more Aramaic, whereas Azavthani is the Hebrew root. And so it's difficult to know exactly what Jesus was doing. Was he attempting to fulfill a messianic hymn, or was he simply um, in pain, crying out in his human anguish? Let's take time for maybe one or possibly two more questions before we wrap things up. Uh-huh. Well, thank you, Kevin, for a um, wonderful lecture. I really appreciate your um, lecture on the, on the incarnation. So um, my question was, my question is, you have emphasized the importance of incarnation of Christ for us as a Bible students for better understanding than I would like to know how the view of atonement regards to the incarnation of Christ plays. So is the incarnation of Christ applies to all human beings, or is it just for the elect? How, how did Athanasius say about this, and what is your view on that? So you're basically asking me, for the elect only, or for the entire world? So, uh, quick poll, who's, who's a Calvinist in here? Um, <laughs> I, uh, there are definitely language where, there is definitely language where he talks about um, the elect. And there is definitely language where he talks about um, for instance, God condescending to the entire creation, obviously, in Jesus. Um, is there a hard line on that? From my reading, I don't, yeah, I, I didn't see it. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Athanasius wasn't a Calvinist. Let's take one last question. <laughs> Devin, thank you. Great job. We're all really blessed by this. Um, my question is, if correct understanding of orthodox view of Jesus um, comes from, a, um, a, from, from above, uh, from understanding the Trinity, how much uh, does someone have to know about the Trinity to be a Christian? And if that, uh, a follow-up question, follow-up question is, how does this play into teaching children? Okay. Well, I don't think you can be... I'll be very careful when I say this. 
A correct understanding of Jesus will always lead you to a Trinitarian understanding of Jesus. Um, always. I, I, I cannot meet a believer who says, Oh no, I'm a Christian believer. Understood, I understand what Jesus has done for me and not understand that Jesus is fully God. So, and that's answering your first question. And then teaching kids, well, they are going to have to learn difficult theology. <laughs> um, there are certainly ways where you can um, give them bits and pieces, if you will. I know my pastor back home did that um, to the children um, in my church. Um, but for them to understand that there's more going on than Jesus just being a really righteous man. Thank you to all of you for coming. This has been the last of our lectures for this year of the Athanasius Lectures. I'd like to especially thank Kevin for giving us an outstanding thank lecture. You. Thanks to our panelists for your engagement. And I'd like to also personally thank, you, thank Sean Fowler, <laughs> who's been the, the producer for this event this year, and he's been working to get next year's lineup already. Thank you so much, and have a great night. Yeah.